So I did a video, video recently on glutathione. Uh, it was in the Huffington Post, written by Mark Hyman at, with the Institute of uh, Functional Medicine. I believe he's at Mayo as well. Um, he calls it the uh, mother of all antioxidants. For those of you that are remembering or not remembering exactly what an antioxidant does, uh, we can get into the biochemical details later, but here, this just makes a good point. Um, Oxidation is what our body uses to create energy. That's why, uh, that's what uh, the iron in our blood does. It carries oxygen. So we're therefore able to make, what, 30, 35 units out of um, a basic glucose molecule, units of energy, whereas a, a mold or fungus can only make four or five. However, there's a bad side to oxidation, and that is this process. This looks like an apple rotting, and that's exactly what it is, and that's oxidation. If you're a mechanic, you know oxidation as uh, rusting. So, <clears throat> antioxidants, that's why antioxidants are so important. And guess what? Uh, there's a good case to be made that um, uh, glutathione is the mother of antioxidants. Now, <clears throat> Can we, this video is going to be about supplementation with glutathione. So one of our viewers, Gigi Friedman, basically said, look, so is it possible to supplement with glutathione or is it better to get it through food? I've used it before, but now I'm not sure if it's, a vi if it's viable as a supplement. John Lorscheider has uh, been there, done that. Um, that's not unusual. John's uh, got a very uh, deep background in this area, knows a lot, um, <clears throat> and is actually a great uh, uh, model for patient self-awareness uh, and uh, awareness of the science and self-advocacy. Here's John's perspective. The oral bioavailability of glutathione is extremely poor, and the taste is awful. Been there, done that. So he goes on to um, to quote an article, and I thought it's a good article. I thought I would cover it today. It's a a randomized clinical trial where they gave people not only regular um, glutathione but reduced glutathione, and then they took a lot of measurements of glutathione level, uh, oxidation reduction status in the body. But <clears throat> I will uh, go through that in just a minute. Before I do, my name is Ford Brewer, uh, F-O-R-D, Brewer, B-R-E-W-E-R, -E PrevMed, uh, preventive uh, medicine. We help patients prevent um, heart attack, stroke, uh, dementia, disability. Now, <clears throat> The article that we're talking about is in the Journal of Alternative and Complementary Medicine. For those of you that are uh, academically against looking at a journal like that, I will let you know the, uh, the academic rigor of this journal, certainly, I mean, of this article certainly appears to be excellent. And um, there's a whole debate around what's the weak link in terms of uh, medicine in the U.S. today. One of them being academics versus another one being the, the ability to engage patients in uh, health behavior. Different activity, different uh, video. So this is about the citation on the effects of oral supplementation on, of um, glutathione on systemic oxidative uh, stress biomarkers in human volunteers. So the, uh, the authors were Jason Allen and Ryan uh, Bradley. Both of them appear to be, uh, have doctorates in nutrition and masters in public health. So they know a little bit about statistics and uh, managing uh, research programs. This uh, was in September, 2011, by the way. And um, <clears throat> Here's what they did. Again, as I mentioned before, very good uh, write-up in terms of the science. The objective is to, to uh, determine the effects of um, glutathione supplementation on biomarkers, systemic biomarkers of uh, oxidation and reduction in glutathione levels. The design was a randomized, uh, double-blind, placebo-controlled clinical trial. The uh, 
the setting was uh, the University uh, Research Institute where they were in Kenmore, Washington. Uh, the subjects, 40 uh, volunteers, adults uh, with no uh, chronic diseases. <clears throat> The intervention was uh, oral uh, glutathione, 500 milligrams, twice a day, and uh, the volunteers were followed for four weeks. Um, <clears throat> outcome measures, they looked at uh, creatinine standardized. This is a good point. Creatinine helps us standardize the volume of urine, so you could get, depending on the increase or decrease in urine volume, you could get a decrease in the... Uh, the biomarkers that we're looking at here. And the biomarkers that they're looking at are uh, F2 isoprostanes. That's, uh, that's known as the uh, lifestyle lie detector. If you start uh, doing some things bad in your lifestyle, like uh, decreasing your exercise, um, going the wrong way with your diet, you'll actually see an increase in reduction associated with F2 isoprostanes. Uh, urinary 8-hydroxydeoxyguanosine uh, another indicator. And then they looked just at the um, glutathione itself in the erythrocytes. Erythrocytes are red blood cells. So <clears throat> they had several different uh, ways of looking at the impact of this glutathione supplementation. And they actually also looked at reduced glutathione, which I think uh, John mentioned in his comment. It's supposed to be a little bit better. Um, Results, no differences in oxidative stress before, during, or after uh, supplementation. So that's the story. Uh, you got a really good trial here. This is not the only scientific evidence, but again, I think it helps put the information out there that supplementation with glutathione itself does not appear to be that effective. For those of you who are still interested, I'll go in and cover a few more details, including a couple of uh, um, uh, charts and graphs out of the study. Um, <clears throat> in terms of an in introduction, um, they go on and, and make the point that uh, glutathione is very important in oxidation reduction, uh, especially of uh, endogenous metabolic products like lipid peroxides, as well as xenobiotic compounds. The xenobiotic means st stuff that also comes from outside and impacts our body, like pollutants. Um, that, that crowd that gets into uh, chelation associated with pollutants and heavy metals um, will often uh, do a, uh, add some IV glutathione at the end of that process. They go on in terms of this introduction and, and discussion of the importance of the product uh, uh, project and topic. Talk about the role of, of aging. There's a lot of folks, and you can make a fairly good uh, debate point that this decrease in our body glutathione level does appear to be very much related to uh, aging, physiologic aging. Uh, metabolic disease, environmental toxicity, physiologic aging, and you actually do see a significant continued decline in um, body glutathione levels starting about age 45 for most of us. <clears throat> I would say there's, uh, there's also some significant epigenetic issues as well and uh, uh, carbohydrate metabolism uh, issues. Again, a debate for a, a different point. Um, <clears throat> and they also did make the point that when you look through the literature, there is minimal evidence anywhere else in the science that you can actually impact your uh, glutathione levels by taking glutathione. Now, <clears throat> so I'm going to put up the rest of the study, uh, except for the, the uh, tables. Go through these real quick. Basically, this was a table of what do the volunteers look like? What are their demographics, age, BMI, uh, systemic blood, uh, blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure? In other words, basically looking to see is there any potential for bias as we get started? And no, it appears to be a very, fairly randomized uh, group of adults. This uh, uh, linear, curve, uh, linear uh, graph is showing this is the impact of uh, glutathione 
and reduced glutathione, which is supposed to be a little bit better. Um, on erythrocyte or red blood cell glutathione level. These differences, by the way, are not significant. Here's the uh, urinary isoprostane levels. There's some change. Again, not significant. Um, this was the other marker. Again, not significant. <clears throat> So, if you go back and you remember, you view the other uh, video that I did on Mark Hyman's article in the Huffington Post, um, you'll notice, and I pointed it out, he gives nine tips on how to increase glutathione. None of those nine tips has to do with oral supplementation, because he knows what's in the science around this that, uh, that we just covered. Oral supplementation for glutathione does not appear to work at least according to the current scientific evidence. So he did have some recommendations. I'll run through those real quick. Um, <clears throat> consume sulfur-rich foods. That would be like cruciate vegetables, kale, collards, cabbage, cauliflower, etc. Try bioactive uh, whey protein. What's the science behind that? I don't know. I'm a little bit skeptical on, on the scientific evidence behind a few of these. This is one of them. Uh, the next one is not. Uh, exercise boosting uh, glutathione in levels. It's uh, clear that exercise does, and again, you can see that in isoprostanes and some other ways. N-acetylcysteine is a chemical that we used to give for Tylenol overdose, uh, still given. Um, different topic, different discussion for another, point, another time. Alpha lipoic acid. So as you see, he's starting to talk about some supplements, just not glutathione supplementation. Uh, one of the biggest uh, supplementation points is methylated uh, supplements. Again, methylation is very much related to uh, the oxidation reduction processes that we're talking about here, um, especially methylated folate, vitamins B6, B12. Um, <clears throat> Selenium is thought to have a, a positive impact, selenium uh, uh, supplementation. Vitamin C and E, the, uh, the vitamins that are antioxidant, known as the antioxidant vitamins, and even a thing called milk thistle. Again, I don't, I don't know the research, the science evidence behind those supplements. I'll take a look at that uh, sometime, hopefully soon, and uh, give you some feedback on it. Uh, if you're still hanging in there, thank you so much for your attention. Um, that's it.